the M3 and M5 Stuart light tanks may have been some of the most recognizable American tanks from World War II, but before them came the M2 series of light tanks. These shared similarities, but were also very different from their successors. By 1935, the light tanks of the United States Armed Forces were beginning to resemble what would later become the iconic M3 and M5 Stuart tanks. The infantry's M2A1 light tank, pictured on the right, had many similarities to the cavalry's M1 combat car, pictured on the left, of 1934 and its variants, as they had been designed concurrently. The vehicles were armed only with machine guns. Before the M1 combat car and M2 light tank models were approved for production, attempts to produce tanks had been a struggle. The significantly negative economic event known as the Great Depression, along with a strong isolationist sentiment and policy, had caused funding for the army to be scarce. On top of this, there were those in the army who adamantly believed that armor did not have a place in future conflicts, as they would rather ride around on their horses. The federal government, in its infinite wisdom, had also introduced the National Defense Act of 1920, or NDA, which introduced many stipulations and regulations for U.S. military operations. For example, the cavalry had to name their armored vehicles combat cars, since under the NDA they were forbidden from operating tanks. By the 1930s, the tank reserves of the U.S. Army consisted mostly of either outdated models or overly ambitious dead-end designs. Outmoded tanks such as the Mark 8 Heavy or M1917, which was practically a World War I vintage, were still in service by 1932. In the spring of 1933, new requirements were put forth. Importance was placed on a maximum weight of roughly 6.8 metric tons or 7.5 U.S. tons. Previous designs, such as the combat car T4E1, had proven to be mobile, utilizing Christie-type suspension and a controlled differential, but they were heavier and nearly twice as expensive as subsequent designs. On the 23rd of April 1934, a combat car T5 and light tank T2 were demonstrated at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Both vehicles had been designed and built by Rock Island Arsenal and were very similar. Despite this, the key difference between the two prototypes was the suspension. Combat Car T5 featured VVSS bogies and would be standardized as Combat Car M1. On the other hand, Light Tank T2 utilized semi-elliptical leaf spring bogies, suspiciously similar to those found on the British design Vickers 6-ton. The tracks and the turret also differed from the production model M2A1. Following the trials, it was apparent that the leaf spring bogies were inferior to the VVSS bogies in every way. The T2 pilot would be modified to accept the new VVSS bogies, tracks, and running gear, and renamed T2E1. It was standardized as light tank M2A1 in 1935. After T2E1, only nine additional M2A1 tanks would be produced before the introduction of the M2A2. The clear change from the M2A1 to the M2A2 was the twin turret layout, which was put on trial with the experimental light tank T2E2. Much as light tank T2 had borrowed the VVSS system for combat car T5, the idea behind the twin turrets was also inspired by an early version of the T5. The tank was accepted for service not long after the M2A1 had itself been approved and it was slated for mass production in 1936. The design choice to mount two separate turrets had legitimate reasons behind it. The drive shaft was mounted rather high because the crankshaft of the radial engine was in the center of the tall power plant. Due to this, the turret crew had to straddle and maneuver around it while attempting to operate the turret. As you can see, this crewman is not having a good time. Placing two smaller turrets side by side placed the crew on either side of the drive shaft, removing it as an obstacle. The turrets of the M2A2 were not identical. The larger commander's turret housed the 50 caliber M2HB machine gun, and the gunner's turret housed a 30 caliber M1919 A3 or A4 machine gun. The twin turret layout of the M2A2 led to it being given the nickname May West, allegedly in reference to the movie actress's busty figure. Both variants of the turrets were riveted, and they could rotate roughly 180 degrees. 
Armor for both of the turrets and the commander's cupola was 16 millimeters, roughly 0.625 inches all around. The hull of the M2A2 was rather boxy, and it is here that the M2A2 and M2A3 truly resemble the later M3 Stuart tanks. Armor was thickest at the front at 16 millimeters or 0.625 inches, while the sides were 13 millimeters thick. The M2A2 was powered by a Continental R670 engine installed in the rear. This engine was known for its usage in aircraft. It was an air-cooled seven-cylinder four-stroke radial engine. Throughout its manufacture, the M2A2 would be powered by a few different versions of the engine. Different variants gave out between 250 and 235 net horsepower. With 250 horsepower and weighing in at 8.527 tons or 9.55 US tons, the tank was quick. The manual transmission was at the front. It had five forward and one reverse speeds. Top speed was 72 kilometers per hour or 45 miles per hour, which roughly matched the Soviet BT-5 fast tank. It turns out the Christie suspension wasn't the only way to go fast. Although the tanks were supposedly limited to 48 km per hour or 30 mile per hour top speed, the speed governor was reportedly often removed because, of course it was. The running gear of the M2A2 was similar to the later Stuart tanks. The sprocket was at the front, but unlike the Stuarts, the idler at the rear was raised and unsprung. There were two vertical volute spring suspension bogies and two return rollers per side. The M2A2 had a crew of four. Commander, Gunner, Driver, and Hull Gunner. The Commander and Gunner sat in the two turrets, with the Commander getting the better armed one. The Driver was in the hull on the left side of the vehicle next to the Hull Gunner. Although not a dedicated anti-armor weapon, the M2 heavy machine gun's large cartridge and its ability to fire in full auto usually made sure those on the receiving end were not going to have a good day. 50 caliber armor piercing rounds could penetrate up to 25.4 millimeters or one inch of vertical rolled homogeneous armor at 500 meters. The 30 caliber M1919 machine gun was less effective in an anti-armor situation, although 30-06 AP rounds were available, as well as standard ball and tracer rounds. A number of changes were made to improve the design of the M2A2. It was noted that the hull of the M2A2 had a tendency to rock back and forth excessively during maneuvers. The design was modified and redesignated M2A3 in 1938, but only 73 were built. The most notable differences between the M2A2 and M2A3 were the hull length and space between bogies. By spacing the bogies further apart and lengthening the volute springs, stability was improved. Further external changes included an increase in the space between turrets and a revised engine deck. Top speed fell to 60 km per hour, or 37.5 miles per hour. Eight M2A3 tanks, designated M2A3E1, were fitted with Gleberson T1020 diesel radial engines. These engines had first been installed on four M2A2 tanks, designated M2A2E1. Armor was increased all around to 22 millimeters or 0.875 inches for the turrets and frontal hull and 16 millimeters or 0.625 inches for the sides and rear. The M2A2-A3 platform would be used to test and develop multiple running gear and drivetrain layouts. The last M2A2 to be assembled would have its armor increased to 25 millimeters or roughly one inch and it was designated M2A2E2. In August 1938, the tank was modified again at Rock Island, including a new running gear and engine, as the hull was lengthened to fit a GM671 inline six, which produced 188 horsepower. The engine sent power to an automatic transmission. With the installation of the GM671 and automatic transmission, the vehicle was redesignated M2A2E3. The suspension was changed again, and a larger idler made contact with the ground. This trailing idler was connected to the rear bogey and was reminiscent of later designs, but it was not the same. It would appear that at some point the M2A2E3 would be updated with the later trailing idler system found on the M3 and M5 series of tanks. M2A3E2 saw the implementation of the Timken Electro Gear transmission, 
which took up significantly more space in the front hull. Only one unit was tested. The M2A3E3 had a revised engine deck and lengthened hull similar to the M2A3, but it utilized its extra length in a new way. The M2A3E3 looked similar to an M3 Stewart hull with two turrets, as the suspension was nearly identical to that of the M3 and M5. Later modifications of the M2A3E3 included the installation of the General Motors V4223 diesel engine that produced 250 horsepower. The increased weight at the rear necessitated the new trailing idler system. The following M2A4 version would be the final iteration of the M2 chassis. It featured a single two-man turret that mounted a 37mm anti-tank gun with a coaxial 30 caliber machine gun. The M2 series would be replaced by the M3 light tank, which had thicker armor and used the trailing idler system. Contrary to what some video games may represent, the M2A2 and M2A3 would never see actual combat, but they were used for training. Perhaps most notably, they were used in the Louisiana maneuvers, which took place in fall of 1941. Along with tanks and airplanes, around 450,000 men in total were deployed with the Red Army and Blue Army, which were pitted against each other in massive mock combat scenarios. During the Louisiana maneuvers, the Blue Army captured the defending Red Army's Air Force with a massive armored flanking maneuver. The 2nd Armored Division took a three-day, 400-mile ride to the west of Louisiana, entering Texas before looping around to capture Red Army's Air Base. The commanding officer of this daring maneuver was none other than Major General George Patton Jr. The Red Army complained that he had broken the rules, to which he replied, I am unaware of the existence of any rules in war. M2A2 and M2A3 tanks would be deployed throughout the United States, from Virginia to Hawaii. Twenty May West tanks were used for training by the 40th Armored Regiment located in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Among the tankers of the 40th was Lafayette Poole, a future tank commander known as the Ace of Aces. Poole and his crew would go on to operate three M4 Shermans named In the Mood and would be responsible for knocking out an attributed 258 German armored vehicles of various types. The M2A2 would also be used during a 1939 U.S. Antarctic expedition known as Admiral Byrd's Third Expedition. Three tanks were lightened by means of removing their turrets, engine covers, and armored hatches to reduce ground pressure and the snowy terrain. Despite the modifications, the tanks ran into issues in the extreme temperatures, but still managed to perform better than other purpose-built vehicles. Looking at you, snow cruiser. Upon the conclusion of the expedition in 1941, at least one tank was left behind on Stonington Island, where it can still be seen to this day. All variants of the M2 light tank will be used during the war in exercises and to train American tankers, but only the final variant, the M2A4, would see limited service overseas. The M2A4 was used for training with the British, but on at least one occasion it saw combat with the U.S. Marines in the Pacific Theater on Guadalcanal. Along with its M3 successors, the M2A4's small size lent well to the terrain, and its 37mm gun was powerful enough to deal with Japanese armor and light fortifications. After the war, all M2 light tanks were retired from service. Although they may have been outdated by the outbreak of World War II, the M2A2 and M2A3 tanks provided a solid chassis and components for future tanks. They were used to modernize American combined arms doctrine, and they trained tank crews who would soon see action overseas. The M2A2 and M2A3 tanks were a stepping stone on the path the U.S. Army was taking towards developing an effective light tank, and even the medium tanks stole bits and pieces from them. What do you think? Would the 50 caliber armed M2A2 and M2A3 tanks still have been effective scouting vehicles despite their lack of a cannon? Would they have proved useful against the relatively weak Japanese armored vehicles in the Pacific? Or was it the right choice to keep them at home for training?